right, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Truth of Tracing Tartans, Scottish Clan Research. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be moderating today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is researcher Kimberly Ministo. Kim earned her BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing from Western Michigan University. She joined American Ancestors as a researcher in the Research and Library Services Department and as a certificate holder from the Boston University Genealogical Research Certificate Program. She was introduced to genealogy at a young age and has over 30 years of experience in research and report writing. Her areas of expertise include early Pennsylvania settlers, colonial New Jersey, Quaker records, the Midwest, Finnish, DNA, Descendancy Research, Scottish and English Hereditary Peerage Titles, and Scottish Genealogy, with a particular interest in genetic markers and male clan descendancy. So, if you've ever stopped into a Scottish goods store, you may have been given the impression that finding your Scottish clan or tartan is as simple as finding your surname on a long list of options and picking out the corresponding kilt, crest, or other merchandise proudly display displaying your clan name. If only it were so easy. In reality, only about 20% of Scottish surnames have a clan connection, and it can be very difficult to trace those connections. In this lecture today, Kim Ministo will discuss the historical context of clan and tartan research, key terms, strategies, and resources for researching your clan connection. At any point during today's presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. We'll address as many of those as we can at the end. There's also a syllabus available for this presentation, uh, and that is available for purchase at our online bookstore. The link was in your reminder email from today, and it will also be in our follow-up email later this evening. This presentation is also being recorded for later viewing on our website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kim. Thank you, Kathleen, and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. So we have a short amount of time to cover a lot of information, so I'm really going to just kind of jump right in so we have enough time to cover everything and then also leave some time at the end to answer some questions um, at the end of this webinar. So I've broken down today's webinar into three parts, um, all of which are really important when trying to trace your Scottish ancestors back to a time and place that can hopefully help you identify an associated clan. So first we're gonna talk um, about some history and some facts about the clan system. And then I'll talk a little bit about the history of Scotland as it pertains to the clans. Next, we'll talk about emigration and the reasons why the Scots left their homeland and where they could have gone. And then finally, we'll talk about some record collections, some research strategies, and br briefly discuss DNA and how it can help you in your search. So first, let's just start off and we'll talk a little bit about the clan history. So one of the oldest clans on record is thought to be Clan Donahue, which is also known as Clan Robertson, and it dates back to about the 11th century. So the word clan is derived from the Gaelic word clown, which means children. So a clan was a tribal kinship-based system um, that controlled the land within their territory and was also responsible for the people. So the clan system in Scotland remained functional until the Battle of Culloden in 1746, but it was facing its fair share of struggles before that, and Culloden was just that final blow to the clan system in more ways than one. So over 1,200 Jacobites, um, those who supported the restoration of the House of Stuart uh, back to the throne, died in the Battle of Culloden with Clan Fraser and Clan Cameron losing particularly large numbers. 
Um, it's important to note that not everyone belonged to a clan and not all clan members were blood related to the clan's chief. And clans were not just in the Highlands. They were also lowland clans, island and border river clans. And some of the oldest and most powerful clans were founded by foreigners from Normandy or ancient Britain and France. So here we have an image on the left showing this imaginary border between the highlands that was in gray and the lowlands in white. So notice that the coastal areas to the east like Aberdeen were considered part of the lowlands. And this was because people's values and traditions in these coastal areas tended to align with lowlanders, which is why they are considered part of this group despite being so far north. And then on the right, you have an image of the border between Scotland and England, where the border reaver clans were located. So not, not, not all of these names listed here in this image north of the border were official clans. Some were just referred to as families, which is also what they were called south of the border in England. So there's a general structure to the clan system with the chiefs at the top, and of course, um, they were responsible for all the decisions pertaining to clan affairs. So the chief succession was governed by a system called Tanistry, which was an ancient, ancient Celtic tradition that proclaimed the chief's heir, or Tanist, as they were called, needed to be a qualified individual from the hereditary line. Then directly under the chiefs were the chieftains, who were essentially the heads of large branches of individual families that made up the clan. So then directly under below them were the Downey Isle, which were the gentlemen of the clan. And so you can think of them as the more elite members. And then at the very bottom of the structure, you have the main body of the clan, which included the tenants. So a clan-based system regarded the land as property of the entire clan and that was held in common. So starting in the 12th century, legally Scotland fell under the feudal system but the remoteness of the Highlands allowed the Highland clans to maintain their tribal-like system and continue to maintain, maintain control of their land. So the goal of a clan was to increase the size of the clan and the territory it held. So battles were one way they accomplished this because after a clan victory, the defeated families and their associated lands were now incorporated into the clan's holdings. So many of these new families would then take the clan surname as their own, as a way of swearing an oath of allegiance to their new chief. So any family who swore fidelity to the clan chief now fell under the chief's protection. Some families, um, like they may have done this out of necessity. For instance, like the environment in Scotland was incredibly rough. Uh, the weather was something to be desired and the land was really hard to work. So it was a lot easier to have the support of a clan in order to survive than to be the sole provider for your family. The clan also provided protection from raiders, which was crucial for survival in an often violent and bloody Scotland. So as I've already stated, the chief was responsible for all clan matters, and that included deciding who married who, which was a second way the clan increased their size and territory. So most marriages among the clan were arranged we just have a volume thing. Hold on one second. I think it sounds okay to me, Kim. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so most marriages among the clan were arranged marriages orchestrated by the chief. So the chief expected clan members to marry clan members, but the chief also arranged marriages with other clans to form alliances and also to increase the clan's holdings. So this was often the case for clans like the McDonald's and the McKenzie's, who calculated whose their calculated marriages helped them maintain their status as some of the largest clans in Scotland. So shown here on the right in beige is, is a map um, of the clan Donald's holdings in the 16th century, which was one of the largest of the Highland clans. So at one time they controlled the Western seaside and almost a third of the whole kingdom. And they also controlled some land in Northern Ireland. So you can see how marriages and all of the raiding and the battles, you know, just increased their land holdings. So as clans grew either by choice or marriage or force, they became more powerful and responsible for more and more families. So you'll often hear the word sept associated with Scottish clans. So the word was 
concept was taken from the Irish cult culture, and some people want that term phased out, and they would really like to see it replaced with the phrase dependent families of a clan. But regardless of the term that we use to describe them, some of these families were really large and powerful clans in their own right, but they were still in need of some form of alliance for one reason or another. And these families didn't share the same surname as the chief, but they were still considered an extended part of the clan family. So a pretty comprehensive list um, of clan seps and dependents can be found on a site called Electric Scotland. It's a little bit difficult to navigate that site, but it's definitely one that I, if you're going to be getting into clan research and Scottish research, that I would spend some time navigating. Um, they have a lot of great information um, on there about um, all sorts of topics. So I wanna take one minute here to make a distinction um, about the difference between two terms, and that is the term a chief and a laird. So I've heard them used interchangeably um, when it comes to the leader of a clan, but it's, that's really an incorrect um, way to uh, thing to do. So a chief is the formal legal term under Scottish law when referring to a leader of a recognized clan. So the chief himself can only be acknowledged after a formal petition is approved by the Lord Lion, uh, King of Arms, who regulates heraldry in Scotland. A laird, on the other hand, is a term applied to someone who just owns an estate, and neither a chief nor a laird are, represent Scottish nobility. So to give you an idea of how many dependent families could be under one clan, here is a list of dependent families that fell under the protection of Clan Buchanan. So as you can see, even if your surname is not one of the clans that's been recognized by the Lord Lion, it's very possible that your ancestors were a dependent family of a clan. And again, Electric Scotland has a fantastic list of all dependent clans or, or, or seps under a clan. So clans can be traced back to a specific region in Scotland, and knowing where your Scottish ancestor hailed from is essential when it comes to tracing your clan roots. It's incredibly important to determine and support with historical records where in Scotland your ancestor was from in order to help you trace a line to a certain clan. And this might not be possible for everyone, as, as Kathleen stated, you know, if you know your ancestor could have hailed from Scotland, but there's an estimate that shows between about 30% of Scots and maybe even less um, were part of the clan system. So this clan map of Scotland here um, was made by the publisher Collins. And it, it's one that I keep on hand whenever I'm doing Scottish research because it lets you see where, it gives you a sense of what clans were in a particular area. So if you can kind of you know, isolate your ancestor to a certain area, and you're not falling under the name McKay or Sutherland, you can then go on to Electric Scotland. You can look at the list of SEPs and see if possibly your family was a dependent sept of a clan. So Scottish descendants love to show their Highland pride and support for their affiliated clan. And they do this by displaying the clan's tartan. However, not all clans had a tartan and in fact, in general, the colorful tartans that make kilts today did not come about until after 1822 when, when George IV visited Edinburgh wearing a colorful kilt, which became the catalyst for one of the most incredible marketing schemes ever. So before the act of prescription following the Battle of Culloden in 1746, um, which prohibited Highland dress, Highlanders wore the woven fabric called a plaid, which was the name of the fabric and not the pattern, and this wool was generally dyed with whatever grew in the area. So it could have been dyed from berries or plants or soil. So, and this is where that local weaver lived. So they were rather dull in color. So the ancient kilts, which are much larger than what you see today because um, they were functioned as a blanket, um, there, there's evidence of them being brightly colored plaids before the 18th century, but the idea that a checkered cloth was specific to a clan or area before this time is false. So ancient clans could, however, be recognized by the plant they wore in their bonnet, which we can see here in this image on the right. And I think there's also on Electric Scotland, there is a list of uh, plants that identify uh, um, different clans. So there's no governing body um, over clan tartans. So you, so someone can wear like whatever clan tartan that they want. Um, there is something called a Scottish Register of Tartans, 
um, which I've provided the link in the handout, but this is not a government controlled register, regardless of how official it sounds. So keep in mind that if you can't link your ancestor to a particular clan, you can still wear whatever tartan you want for whatever reason to honor your Scottish heritage. But the same cannot be said um, for the crest or the motto. So the crest and motto are specific to the clan chief. It is their sole property, which has been recognized by the Lord Lion of Arms, who I mentioned previously regulates heraldry in Scotland. So clan members can wear the chief's crest, which usually includes the motto, as long as it's encircled by a strap and a buckle, as seen here in the image on the right. So there are no family coat of arms in Scotland, only the chief's coat of arms, which again is their sole property. In fact, it is illegal in Scotland to own any representation of a chief's coat of arms. So you won't see a coat of arms on silverware or signs or, or glass windows in Scotland because it's against the law and it would be confiscated. So most clan chiefs were not Scottish nobility, um, as I stated earlier, but there were some instances um, like the chief of Clan Campbell, for instance, who also holds the title of the Duke of Argyll. So most of the Scottish nobility um, clan chiefs can be found around Edinburgh, Falkland, or Stirling. So it's important to note that not all clans had a chief, and um, these types of clans were known as armagers clans, so if a clan didn't have a current chief, then a clan member could wear the clan crest encircled by a strap and buckle of the last known chief. Um, if you were a married woman, you would wear the, um, the, the crest of your husband. And if you were unmarried, you would wear the crest of your father. So I'm gonna take a minute, maybe a couple minutes, because it's a really difficult when it comes to surnames to talk about the issues you're likely gonna run into when re researching your Scottish ancestors. So as I previously mentioned, um, when a family was absorbed by the clan, they often, but not always, took the surname of their new chief. So it's important to understand that surnames change maybe several times, both before and after the collapse of the clan system. It wasn't unheard of for a clan member, even a blood-related clan member, to change their surname after the failed Jacobite uprising in 1746 and also to not change it back after prescription was repealed in 1782. So then there's the example where the clan itself was prohibited from using their clan surname. Um, an example of this would be the McGregors, um, whose surname was banned by King James IV in 1603. So even late, later, when they could have reclaimed their surname after the law was repealed in 1774, many of them didn't, many of them didn't for one reason or another. Um, in cases like this, people may have taken the surname of their mother, um, which can help you in tracing your Scottish ancestors. You will also find that many clans' names were Englishized from Scottish Gaelic, um, this, like this example here for Clan Donald. And Scottish surnames can be spelled multiple ways, as shown here with the clan name McNeil. Which brings me to the Mick versus Mac argument. Um, and some will tell you that Mick with the MC is only an Irish name, but that's just simply not true. So many Scottish surnames were patronymic names that changed generation to generation. So Mac means son of, but this could have been abbreviated several ways, such as the MC that I showed you on the previous slide, or even an M with an apostrophe as shown here with the surname McKay. So keep in mind, you will need to look at all variant spellings of a surname when researching your Scottish ancestors. And I'll also caution you, depending on the site that you're at, um, sometimes you would, could put in a name and it's not going to bring in all variant spellings. So you're going to have to put in the variant spellings yourself, use, um, use wild cards. And, and so if you don't understand that, I would look into that and also understand when you go on a certain site, how, how their search engine works. So also keep in mind that children, they may have been given several forenames. For instance, you may know your ancestor as Alexander Oxton, but he may have been born James William Alexander Oxton, and he could be recorded in records by any of these forenames. And it's also important to note that some females had male names like John or Bruce, and some males could have had female names like Anne. And nicknames were often very common in Scotland, like Sarah for Morag or Maggie for Margaret. 
So it gets really confusing, um, but one good thing to know is when it comes to Scottish names um, is that families often followed um, naming patterns that can help you trace your ancestors. And this is particularly important when there are several people of the same first and last name in the same area, which you unfortunately are gonna run into a lot. So traditionally in Scotland, uh, the oldest son would be named for the paternal grandfather and the oldest daughter for the paternal grandmother. Then the next generation would flip-flop with the second son being named for the maternal grandfather and the second daughter for the paternal grandmother. And then the third son would usually be named after the father and the third daughter after the mother. And then children after that normally would take the names of aunts and uncles. So in the Scottish, we're also known to name a child after a deceased child. So you want to keep that in mind when you're looking at vital records. And then maternal names were um, sometimes used as middle names. For example, I have an ancestor, Alexander Fraser Ogston, in my line, which helped me identify the correct person in records. So another fact that confused matters is if your family came from a coastal fishing village where the same surname was also incredibly common, someone may have tacked on the name of their boat to the end of their surname to distinguish them from somebody else. So there's so much we could talk about when it comes to the history of Scotland, but during this webinar, we are just going to talk about a few key events in Scotland that impacted the Scottish clans and immigration. So here's a quick timeline of events, um, of the major events that impacted the clans, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So first you have in 1603, where Scotland and England um, shared the same monarch, and this union allowed England and Scotland, um, or allowed Scotland to establish early settlements in the New World. Then in 1650, we have Oliver Cromwell, who defeated the Scottish troops and imposed a parliamentary union with England. In 1707, the United Kingdom was formed. And between 1710 and 1776, we started to see the first major wave of migration out of Scotland. In 1715, that marked the first Jacobite rebellion, followed 30 years later by the second major rebellion in 1745. And shortly after the Battle of Culloden in 1746, the English monarch enacted the Act of Prescription. And then not long after, we have a time period known as the Clearings, which occurred between 1750 and 1850. And this overlapped with the second major wave of migration between 1780 and 1820. So understand that um, immigration to the, um, of the Scots happened at a lot slower place um, and in fewer, uh, slower pace and in fewer numbers than German speaking immigrants, for instance which I think this bar graph does a really good job of showing them. It's a, a bar graph of arrivals um, in the port of Philadelphia between um, the years 1710 and 1769. So if you look at the years 1710 to 1719, which is represented by the arrow on the top, this covers the first wave of migration and the first Jacobite rebellion. And here you have an estimated 364 Scots and Scotch-Irish came into Philadelphia and then in the second arrow at the bottom, between 17 and 1759, which was after the second Jacobite rebellion and the start of the clearings, you see an estimated 6,605 Scotch and Irish, Scotch-Irish arrived in Philadelphia. So note here that the Scots were not even isolated in this estimate. So even though you have other ports, the major social and economic events occurring in Scotland in the 18th century was not necessarily creating this mass exodus of Scots um, leaving for the colonies at any given time before the 18th century, unlike German speaking people. But Scottish immigration would pick up the pace prior to the second wave that started in 1780. So as I mentioned earlier, when Scotland joined with England very early on in the 17th century, it allowed Scotland to try and establish settlements in the new world. So a large portion of immigrants from the 17th century were from the lowlands. The Highlanders tended to arrive in larger numbers in the 18th century for reasons we'll talk about shortly. But one of the first early settlements was in Nova Scotia or New Scotland in 1629, but this colony was wiped out by 1632. 
Then in 1683, um, you have a lot of Scottish Quakers that went to East Jersey to escape religious persecution, and they eventually would migrate to other places like Pennsylvania. In 1684, some Scotch purchased land in South Carolina and built Stewardstown. And this group consisted of Presbyterian, Scot Presbyterian Scots called Coventers who were seeking an escape from religious persecution during the reign of King Charles I. But this settlement was also wiped out I and mean, it was wiped out by the Spanish and Indian allies in 1686. So then you have near um, then you have near Panama you have New, New Caledonia um, that was settled in 1698 and it was intended to be a training colony but the lack of planning provisions was its downfall and it was wiped out by 1700 by disease and the Spanish. <clears throat> so Highlanders from Inverness started to arrive in Darien in Georgia around 1736. Um, these were Highlanders that were recruited from uh, by George Dunbar and Hugh McKay. And these Scots started to abandon this settlement in about 1739, but many of them ended up going to South Carolina. So Cape Fear in North Carolina, which was settled in 1739, was one of the more prosperous Scottish settlements that we saw. Um, they were called the Argyle Colony. In 1760, about 20,000 more Scots would come to the general area and settle in areas like Cumberland, Harnett, and more counties. So I always I, I mention Electric Scotland again. Um, it's a great resource to read about some of these earlier settlements. Um, they often supply names of early settlers. For instance, Cape Fear had a lot of Frasers and McDonald's and McKay's and McLeod's. So you'll want to go look at Electric Scotland um, and look for your surname under some of their um, resources for Scot um, settlements. <laughs> Excuse me. So then, of course, you have the Ulster Plantation in Northern Ireland. Uh, that attracted a lot of Scots starting in 1609. I'm not going to dive too, do, um, too deep into Ulster, but the condensed version is the land in Ulster was taken by the British um, from, the Scot uh, from the Irish clans O'Neill and O'Donnell, and an effort was made to settle Scottish Presbyterians in an area to secure a majority in Ireland. So when trying to trace your Scottish ancestors back to Scotland, it's not, it's very important to keep in mind that they could have came from Ulster and not directly from Scotland. That's a very common mistake that I see. Um, a lot of Scottish men who couldn't inherit their father's estate, as well as the more common man, would take their chances in Ulster. So I talked about the issues of surnames and tracing your ancestors. So an important thing to note is that a lot of colonists um, would take new surnames after establishing themselves in Ulster because they wanted to blend into this new society. Uh, they could have randomly chosen a, a new surname. Uh, they may have taken the name from the estate they were living on, or oftentimes they would just take the name of an influential member of the plantation. So I can't stress how important it is to follow the records and not jump to conclusions about your Scottish ancestors. So the Ulster Plantation, um, you know, it struggled at times. It had a really rough start, um, but the Scots did very well there until about 1717 when the native Irish banded together to buy back their land. And then they raised the rents, which forced the Scottish tenants out. This was one of the events that started the first major wave of Scots to America. So there is a great webinar called The Scotch-Irish in America by um, my colleague Rhonda McClure. Um, that's in our video library if you're interested in learning more about Ulster and the Scotch-Irish. So by 1650, around 50,000 Scots were in Ulster. And like Scotland, Ireland had its share of social and economical issues that added to the major wave of Scottish migration to the colonies. So as you can see here um, by the green line in this image on the right, um, that represents the migration pattern of the Scots-Irish from Ulster. Um, many of them came to Philadelphia and then they would take a westward path out of Philadelphia. Uh, they would go down south to Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas and on to Georgia. The red line in this image represent the Highlanders. Uh, they tended to go to areas like New Jersey um, and then go north to New York and Canada, but they also landed in and settled in South Carolina. So since a lot of Scots entered through New England and later Philadelphia, understanding migratory routes in the colonies can really help you if your ancestor dropped off the radar. 
So you may be asking yourself, you know, why is she talking about tracing my ancestor forward in time and not back to Scotland? Scotland. Well, I cannot stress enough how important it is to not leap across the pond too soon when researching your Scottish ancestors. Um, and this is because information that can make your search for them in Scottish records easier may have been left by their descendants on this side of the ocean. And you may need, you just need to exhaust everything here for first or in Canada or Australia, wherever you're searching where they ended up and before digging into records in Scotland. Um, so, cause like, you just really have no idea what they left behind. Um, and you're going to have a really hard time identifying your ancestor in Scottish records. Um, if you don't know approximately where they're from and you definitely won't be able to confidently identify their associated, associated clan. So if we come familiar with migratory routes like this one on the left, um, this is for the Great Wagon Road. It came out of Philadelphia um, and then it went south all the way down to the Carolinas. Uh, and there was a lot of Scottish settlements that were located here um, along this path, which you can see on the right. So because, you know, so if your most recent Scottish ancestors, for instance, you, you found them in Charlotte, North Carolina in the mid 1800s. And family lore says they've been in the colony since the 1700s, but you've hit this brick wall and you cannot find them. You're going to want to look for them in every county along this great wagon trail back to Philadelphia, where they most likely landed or some that whereabouts they landed. So one thing to keep in mind when um, if you don't know where your ancestors are from, Highlanders tended to settle inland in the frontier regions and lowlanders tended to stay in urban areas like Philadelphia. So their location in the colonies, they just might give you a general idea where in Scotland they were from. So I'll give you another scenario of why leaving no stone unturned is so important and how migration patterns can help you. So a lot of Scottish immigrants were loyalists, um, including Highlanders. They, they, and a lot of them would, may have gone up to Nova Scotia at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War or down to Georgia. But if they sought refuge in Georgia, for instance, after the war, their lands were confiscated and they were exiled, exiled from Georgia. And at that point, many of them um, went to Florida, to areas like St. Augustine, which was still controlled by the Spanish. So I had this really long standing brick wall in my family genealogy. And in my case, I used these migratory routes to track down my ancestor to Camden County, Georgia. And then it turns out that I found records um, in um, some magazine articles there uh, that he his land was confiscated. He went down to St. Augustine. Um, there he converted from a Presbyterian to a Catholic and he left enough records behind 60 years later from when I first I found him in, I found him in Philadelphia in uh, 1762. And all those years later, he left behind information in St. Augustine, Florida, um, which included the names of his parents. Um, and it helped me determine that his family had came from Ulster and not directly from so Scotland. So I was able, so exhausting every possible source here led me to Ulster, which then led me back to my family um, that was located in Scotland. So we'll talk a little bit more detail about the different reasons why the Scottish immigrated in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So emigration from Scotland to other areas, it was both voluntary in, and involuntary. And the short version is that it occurred primarily for political, economic, and religious reasons. So in examples of involuntary emigration included uh, Cromwell transporting thousands of Scottish shoulders, um, soldiers after the Scottish were defeated in 1650 during the English Civil War. Um, and then you have the English that um, the English also labeled Scots um, who were once supporters of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland as enemies of the state and banished them to the colonies in the 17th century. Another popular form of involuntary emigration um, used by the English um, until it was banned in 1830 was the act of transporting criminals as punishment. Um, that punishment was for crimes that were both serious and petty. Then, of course, you have the 1715 and 1745 Jacobite rebellions, which exiled men, women, and chil children. Um, they were often placed in servitude. And you can sometimes find um, them in land records listed as real property if you know who purchased them on the side of, of the ocean. 
And many of these cases, these exiles were sent to places like Virginia, New England, um, particularly Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, and the West Indies. So to give you an idea of the environment in the Highlands after the second major Jacobite rebellion started in 1745, we need to talk about King George II's son, William Augustus. Um, he was the Duke of Cumberland, um, and this is who King George put in charge of his, the British troops. Um, he became known as Butcher Cumberland, and not for his the not for his actions at the Battle of Culloden, but what came after. So, following Culloden, uh, British troops were firmly established in forts throughout Scotland. And soon after the battle, Cumberland ordered his troops to kill anyone they suspected of participating in the Jacobite uprising. So many innocent Scots were targeted and they were taken from their homes, their farms were reduced to ashes, and many men, women, and children were either killed or transported to British plantations. So this had a cascading and devastating economic effect on the Highlands, um, which participated thousands of Highlanders to immigrate to the colonies. So I've mentioned the act of prescription a couple times. And um, so what was going on was a series of actions um, to destroy the clans and their identities and accomplish England's goal, which was to suppress and assimilate the Highland culture. So the act of prescription of 1746 um, not only prohibited Highland dress, but it also outlawed engaging in Highland games, um, outlawed speaking Gaelic, uh, the playing of pipes because it was considered an instrument of war, and in addition, it also set out to disarm the Highlanders. So there were several punishments implemented if you were caught breaking the law. So for instance, if you were caught with a weapon, you were jailed and fined 15 pounds sterling that had to be paid in one calendar month. So if you couldn't make that payment, then if you, if you were an able body, you were forced into Her Majesty's military and sent to fight in America. So other offenses had similar fines, and if you were caught a second time, you were transported to one of Her Majesty's plantations for seven years of servitude. So between the laws, um, laws like the Act of Prescription, uh, the Acts of Butcher Cumberland, many Highlanders were executed. Uh, the Scottish clans were dismantled, that warlike society was disarmed, and the Scotland that they knew and loved was just gone. So in our line of work, we get a lot of questions about how can I locate my ancestor on a passenger list? But unfortunately, um, for your early Scottish ancestors, it's going to be hit or miss, um, and it's probably not going to find them, because in general, passenger lists did not exist before the 19th century. So you may read somewhere um, that your ancestor arrived on a certain ship, but in most cases, that information was determined by looking at several different sources in order to make that determination. Now, sometimes you can get lucky. Uh, for, for instance, if your ancestor was transported as a result of the 7, 1715 Jacobite Rebellion, the names of those rebel passengers were recorded, and sometimes they also include the name of their purchaser. So here's an image of a list of 45 rebel prisoners that were transported on the good speed that was bound for Virginia in 1716. Um, this was found in an embarkment list in the colonial office record books. So these are located at the National Archives in Kew, which is in London. Um, so for more information on colonial records on this side of the ocean, which I would definitely examine, I would look at records held by the Library of Congress. Um, you can also try searching by state to see what each state archive holds. So for instance, I know that the Library of Virginia has a colonial records project and a lot of their records are now digitized and you can view them online. Um, so I just want you to understand that trying to determine exactly when and what ship your ancestor arrived on is going to be pretty difficult, um, especially if you haven't done the work to approximate when and where they arrived. So in my experience, um, if a man named David Dobson, who is one of the main authorities on Scottish emigration to the New World, doesn't have an entry for your ancestor in one of his many, many books, then your research will require some in-depth research. And the answer to your question may well not, not be out there because Dobson himself spent countless years looking at and compiling the entries for his books. And these included looking at really obscure and private collections in the UK. So some of his books are titled The Directory of Scots Banished to America, um, Plantations in 1650 to 1775. Um, he also wrote The Directory of Scottish Settlers in North America 
and the ships from Scotland to America. So I would spend some time um, seeing if your ancestor is mentioned in one of his many books and publications um, that he's done. So many Scots, um, you know, they all also left for voluntary reasons, and many reasons were common ones throughout Europe. Um, Scots were often escaping religious persecution, poverty, and famine. They were also escaping high rents imposed by landlords. So honestly, those that emigrated had nothing to lose by leaving and nothing to gain by staying. So until um, 1868, the, the um, so the, acts of, uh, the act of promogeniture was in place in Scotland, which meant that the oldest son automatically inherited his father's entire or main estate and the title that could be passed on with it. So this was another reason why many Scotsmen voluntarily left their homeland for places like Ulster and the colonies. They had a chance there to own their own land or provide for their families or make their own legacy. And there was just nothing left for them in Scotland. So many Scots and the Scotch-Irish, um, they also came to America as an indentured servants. So there are some books regarding these types of immigrants, um, such as The Complete Book of Immigrants in Bondage, 1614 to 1775, and Immigrants in Chain, 1607 to 1776. Um, these are done by Peter Wilson Coldham. And for these ancestors, when you do jump back across the pond, um, try to determine what records may have existed um, for the poor in the Scottish parish where they lived um, before they went to the colonies. They can um, be a really great source of information. So for instance, um, there were some poor law application forms for people from the 20th century uh, that have a wealth of information in them. And they may even name the applicant's parents who were born in the 19th century. These applications also ask the applicants to list every place they've ever lived. Um, and then, of course, if you go into um, most of the poor uh, records are held within um, the Kirk registers and um, in the in the minutes, the Kirk minutes. So you'll find um, all the records for, you know, um, people that were relying on support from the church. And they can be just a really fantastic source of information. So then you have some of those kind of a gray area, um, the, which would be the clearances. Um, so the clearing started in 1750 as a result of agricultural revolution in Scotland, where the landowners were raising the rents and evicting um, and or evicting tenants to make way for sheep, which were more profitable um, than um, having people farm the land. So it wasn't, like I said, you sometimes you could afford the rent, sometimes you chose not to farm the rent, or the other times you were just plain evicted. So, and it was really sad because a lot of the times they were evicted um, by the, the clan chief that that was supposed to protect them. Um, so if, um, if they were evicted, um, then you left involuntarily, but if the rents became a factor, you had a choice to make, whether you were going to stay or take your chances elsewhere. So roughly 11,000 Scots um, were re relocated um, through assistant passage from their landlords. And you might find records for your ancestors in collections like the poor relief and migration records. Um, those are gonna be on Scotland's people. And then many were also assisted by the Colonial Land and Immigration Commission, which you can also find those records. So let's say you exhausted all possible record collections for your ancestors in America or Canada or wherever they ended up. So now what? Well, it's kind of just like any other ancestor we take on. Uh, we want to use the historical records to try to trace our Scottish ancestor back to a place in Scotland, um, hopefully to the mid 1700s. And why I say this time period is because if you can't trace your Scottish ancestor to a place um, in the, if you can only trace them to the place like in the late 1800s, for instance, it's very possible they could have been a transplant or they're just that record has, that trail has just gone cold. So ideally you wanna to try to trace them back maybe about the mid 1700s to a place. And that can really um, help you start then to try to trace down a, cl a, a clan. So when it comes to Scottish records, um, there's a large amount of records that are not gonna be online. Um, so there's a site called the Scottish Archive Network. Um, it's um, also known as SCAN. And it has a really great comprehensive list of all local and regional archives. So there are well over 4,000 private collections in Scotland, um, and these collections are going to come into play before and after you isolate your Scottish clan. So the National Registry of Archives of Scotland has a list of the country's privately held documents, so you're going to want to um, look at that too. 
So make sure you are looking at every level, um, both nationally and locally. For instance, um, the Highland Family History Society um, in Inverness, they have something called a strays index. And this gives the names of all the Highlanders who strayed from their parish of birth that might be helpful. So really look locally um, on all the different types of archives. So here's a list of the main archives um, that can really help you with your research. Of course, we have the National Records of Scotland. Um, that would be the main archive of Scotland. Um, there's also the Mitchell Library. That's in Glasgow. Um, it has city archives and other special collections. Um, then you have the National Library of Scotland. Um, this collection is regarding the history and the culture and the people. And then you have the National Archives um, of the UK, and they also have a very large Scottish record collection. Uh, you have the Scottish Catholic Archives, the Scottish Genealogy Society and Research Center, and also don't forget universities and public libraries. So when you're ready to look for your ancestors in Scottish records, I really recommend, you know, kind of sticking to the classics first. So this, of course, includes census records. Um, the earliest census was taken in 1801, but more complete census records started in about 1841, and they occurred every 10 years. Um, the 1911 census uh, did not survive. Um, so you, luckily there's something called the 1911 enumerator summary books, which has all the transcribed information from the household schedule. So some extents, uh, examples of census substitutes um, can include poll tax records, also known as a head tax, um, that taxed every liable person in the area. There was also a hearth tax, um, which specified the heads of household who paid more than 20 shillings a year in rent, um, and they had to pay an additional tax based on the number of fire, uh, hearth, or stoves within their property. So if Scotland could tax it, they would. Um, it may have been a short-lived tax, but Scotland went on to find something else to tax um, uh, if, they, if they could do it. So they had, uh, I just was looking the other day and they literally had a, a clock tax or a gold or silver watch tax. I mean, window tax, you name it. Look to see what kind of ways people were taxed in the parish where they lived. Um, and then there's also the parish specific records um, that can access census substitutes, um, which includes the lists of heads of households as well as lists of inhabitants and also had population lists. I mean, you can also look for your ancestors in valuation rolls. Uh, they were taken every year starting in 1855 and are um, their list of owners, tenants, and those who occupied buildings and other properties. So all these records can help you continue to trace back to that magic, you know, mid 1700s where you can hopefully then try to um, associate your ancestor with a clan. So then you have civil registers. Um, this has included your birth, marriages, and deaths. Um, they were kept from 1855 onwards, um, and they're organized by district. So like, like vital records here in the U.S., um, there are some privacy, law, privacy laws um, that are going to prevent you from looking at some more recent records. Um, sometimes there's going to be a notation um, in the margin of those original civil registers that denotes if there was a correction made. Um, and this correction could record something like an unexpected death, a divorce, um, or a change of legitimacy of a child. And these changes can be found in collections called the Register of Corrected Entries. So those should, should definitely be looked at um, if you run across that. Um, there is also something called the Neglected Registers. Um, these were entries for births, marriages, and deaths known to have occurred between December 31st, 1880 and January 1st, 1880. Oh, I must have some, so I apologize. I got something wrong with that date. But they were not entered in parish registers, these, these births. So someone had to pay these entries. Um, so if you know that your ancestors were servants, for instance, or part of the poor registers, chances are they're not going to have been in this collection um, because they had to pay to, to go ahead and register this birth or death or marriage. Um, I will caution you, if you use indexes, remember to the order the original records um, from Scotland pe Scotland's people, which can always, always have more information than what was transcribed. So please don't, if you find something in an index, and that doesn't matter what it's for when it comes to Scottish research, you're going to want to track down that original record and order it. So then prior to the 1855, um, we um, have the people of Scotland had a history, you know, we have the um, old parish registers. 
So the people of Scotland had a history of both adhering to the Church of Scotland and going against it. So old parish registers, um, the, they're going to be on Scotland's people, for instance, and they'll give you access to the archives of the Church of Scotland. But they also have Roman Catholic Church records um, and other denominations. Uh, but these do not, they won't include like nonconformists like Methodists, Baptists, and Quakers. You're not going to find those records on there, most likely. Um, they're really hard to find. So if you don't find them on site, um, sites like Find My Past or Family Search, then I would look at the collections um, that are held possibly at the National Archives of Scotland. I would also look at local libraries where that person lived. So um, Highlanders, for instance, were particularly prone to be nonconformists. Um, they also tended to adhere to the Celtic tradition of Catholicism, and those parish records do go back to 1703. Um, they may have also been members of the Free Church, um, which was made of members and ministers that left the Church of Scotland. So indexes for the Free Church, as well as Catholic records, um, can be found on Find My Past. So then you have burial records. Um, for Scotland, it's not as easy as hopping on Find a Grave um, that we're so used to here. But thankfully, Find My Past has a growing list um, of their in their uh, Scotland Monumental Inscriptions Collection. Um, and that is, um, it's combined, it's made from a bunch of collection of various parish registers. So I would definitely check that out um, and, and see if you can find a burial record for your ancestor. So Kirk sessions, they take a little bit of time um, and some patience, but they are probably um, one of the best resources for all sorts of information. Um, it included the comings and goings of the people of the parish and all sorts of details about their lives. Um, the church was the court, basically. So they can include um, bell ringings for burials. Um, these were bells that were rung in memory of the deceased, um, and, and not just the wealthy. It was, they were rung in, in case of the poor. Um, they have mort cloth rentals. Um, those were the cloths that were draped over the caskets for burials. So these are a great resource in absence of death records that weren't legally required before 1855. Um, the Kirk Sessions are also going to have information about um, legitimate children, um, antinuptial relationships, um, punishments handed down for bad behavior, certificates of transferences to other parishes. Um, they're going to have records of household, um, communicant roles, and of course, those poor relief records. And there's, there's a lot of poor people in Scotland, so don't ignore the poor relief records in your parish. Um, they're also going to include those records pertaining to what they call irregular marriages. Um, these were marriages like, so the church was trying to legitimize a couple who had been living on husband and wife, but never married, which was really common practice in Scotland. So going back to some more classics, um, you're going to have the wills and testaments. Um, you're more likely to find the wills and testaments um, in which pertains to the distribution of estate um, for the wealthy people, wealthier people and landowners. Um, people also made wills before a long journey, like before they emigrated or if they were going into the military service. So they are not as packed full of information like we're used to seeing in American records, but they shouldn't be ignored. Um, there are indexes available to help you determine if an original will or probate is available. And the testaments have been indexed on Find My Pass, which is really helpful. So land records may be also helpful if your ancestor was a landowner because they can explain why someone had the right to sell land they possessed. So, of course, Scotland was part of the feudal system until 2004, um, which meant the land was owned by the crown. But ownership was passed to vassals who were those that were loyal to the crown. And then don't forget your newspapers. Um, they're obviously a great source, just like in American records for births, marriage and deaths. So when it comes to understanding record keeping in Scotland, I would look at various explanations that are available. And one of my favorite um, is the National Records of Scotland. Um, it has fantastic informational pages on something they call their research guide A to Z. And honestly, before I would even start researching in Scotland, I would familiar, become familiar with this A to Z guide and everything that all the different records that you can look for. So once you keep getting back in time, um, I would it's going to be harder and harder to, to read the handwriting. So I would also refer to the National Records of Scotland. It maintains this fantastic site called Scottish Handwriting. Um, it can, and it contains like interactive tutorials uh, that can help you read 16th, 17th, and 18th century Scottish records, 
and you're going to need that help as you trace your back your ancestors further in time. So as we wrap things up today, I'm just going to recap what I would do in hopes of identifying a Scottish clam. So you're going to collect and consider all information on this side of the ocean. So has the county or parish of origin been identified? Did they come from Scotland? Did they come from Ulster? Uh, can you estimate the time of arrival? And that might help determine why and where your, in, your ancestor may have emigrated from. So like, did they come from the lowlands versus the highlands? Um, Scotland versus Ulster. So remember, you may need to go forward in time to go backwards. Um, if you can't identify a place, um, I would use surname distribution lists. Um, for instance, there's the surnames of Scotland, the origin, meaning, and history. Um, that can help you identify a place to start in Scotland for your surname. I really wouldn't spend wasted time looking for that elusive immigration year, ship, or passenger list if you have viable proof and approximate year and location. Just move forward because you might find more information when you dig into those Scottish record collections. And then of course, you're gonna conduct that exhaustive search um, to locate your ancestor. And when it comes to Scottish records, start with those classics, then venture into those Kirk sessions, um, and then the more obscure correct record collections. Um, and be careful not to assume you have that correct person. Search until you find the record that proves it. If you're not sure if um, you have found your ancestor, reverse that research process. Um, so if you know the area, but there are multiple people with the same name, then research the life events for each one of those people. Determine who died, um, who can be ruled out, who disappeared from the area and needs to be researched further. So trace that line back to that place um, and that can indicate um, they could have ties to a clan. Again, if you can't trace them back further than 1850, you might have to consider they were they moved into the area at that time. Um, then if you can get back closer to that time of the clans, try to identify clans and dependents in that area. Compare your research results with the clan's history. Um, look for those commonalities like surnames among the dependent clans. Uh, cons consult historical records, join that clan society and search for clan records in both public and private collection. And again, you can find a list of these at the National Register Archives of Scotland. There is going to be a lot of private collections, um, but from clan collections. Um, so let's say you have still have no idea where your ancestor came from in Scotland. That's when you're going to absolutely need to turn to DNA testing. Um, I'm not going to go really deep into DNA testing because frankly, it's, it's a really complicated subject. It requires a lot of research and understanding before you dive into your own DNA. Um, I would consider DNA testing if you've hit a brick wall and also participating in different DNA projects. Um, there's some great ones on family tree DNA, um, surname um, areas. Um, then there's Scottish origins. It may be um, beneficial to, oh, that's another site. And then it may be beneficial to pay for a professional to analyze your results. So in terms of identifying your Scottish clan, uh, why DNA is probably the easiest um, to work with in my, in my opinion. Um, uh, this is that DNA that's passed down from father to son all the way back in time. I realize you're not necessarily going to be able to find someone, but sometimes you can expand that family to the point where you can find somebody and, and even volunteer to pay for their Y DNA test. Um, so I'm going to give an example here, um, but the same concept can work for mitochondrial DNA, which is mother to daughter and autosomal DNA. Um, give a quick example of how you can use that DNA. So um, there is, so again, there's a site called Scottish Origins, which uh, they have a, a lot of fantastic case studies. Um, and I'm going to read something from here, you know, so, so to quote them, someone who tests their Y DNA, they're going to match other males who share a common male ancestor. But the surname for most of those Y DNA matches will be different because you're getting a collection of surnames that arose among a tribal tribal group of related males um, living to a specific location a thousand years ago. So remember when I was talking about all those different names that we can have, you got to remember, you know, they somebody changed names. So if you do a DNA test, you might get some pretty fairly close matches, but you're going to have tons of different surnames. Um, but these res results, um, they can, they can help you trace your line, um, back. So like, let me see if I can, let me show you this right here. So here's an example of a case study, um, where they used, and um, so they use the name Wilson. So this person had a name Wilson. 
Um, and the Scottish Journey Wilson was located. They, they went ahead, they got a map and they found clusters of Wilsons all throughout Scotland. Um, and they did this by looking at historical records, finding out where they showed up. And then what they did is he took the surnames that were closest matches. Those, those were all those Y-DNA tests. And then he found that he matched to also several other names. Uh, he matched to the name um, Elder, Denweddle, Thompson, and Johnston. So then he used records to pinpoint where those family clusters were located. So here you see, again, you have Wilson all over Scotland, but you only have one area in Scotland where all those surnames are close together. So I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of work that went into this, but when you can't, when, but you can see how DNA testing might help you um, when you've done the work, but you've still hit that brick wall. So he was able to find this cluster of, of Wilson and Johnson and Denwoodle all in this area, and they weren't located someplace else. So now he has a general idea of where he can start looking for his ancestors and historical records. Um, and if you've already done your DNA, um, there's a great map. Um, there's a Scottish surname map um, that I've put in the handout, and it can help you save yourself a few steps. It's kind of like looking at like the Where's Waldo, but it may help, and it's going to show you where all these surnames exist in Scotland. So some helpful tips. Um, first, if I, it was me, I'd be searching sites like I would be on Ancestry, Family Search, and Find My fa Past before I turn to Scotland's People. If you use Scotland People before, um, you might know that they charge you um, by the credit. So sometimes you can find these um, records other places. Find My Past has been adding enormous amount of records these past couple of years, enormous amount of Scottish records. So it is definitely worth um, um, buying a membership with them and searching that even be, then you can go on to Scotland's people and find that original record. Um, use the catalog and wiki function on family search um, and similar search engines on other, you know, on other sites to locate what records are available for what parish. Um, the Scottish Genealogy Society has a list of resources for researchers, and, and those are going to be on all kinds of different sites. For instance, Electric Scotland is another one, has great resource sources for information about historical and cultural events. And here's a little example of, uh, I told you how Electric Scotland can be a little bit confusing, um, but one great way to do it um, is it's a one-stop site to learn about like all those historical and cultural events. But the easiest way to navigate this site is to use their search engine, which you can access from their homepage. Um, and again, I had to put a little arrow here. It says it says um, site search engine. So that is the, that's how you're going to have to find that. So it takes a little patience um, to use their site, but there's a lot of information on there. Um, and of course, um, once you find that clan, go find that clan website, go join their page. Um, they're going to have a lot of help. They have blogs. They have uh, a lot of Facebook um, membership pages now for clans. So it's really helpful to do that as well. All right. Thank you so much, Kim, for that excellent presentation. Um, really big topic, and um, you provided a wealth of information there. Um, so we will get to questions in just a moment, um, but first I'm just going to highlight some upcoming events that we have. Um, so first here on April 11th, we will have a free webinar on planning a trip to ancestral homelands, which is presented by our genealogist Rhonda. And on Wednesdays in April, we have a four-week online course on Ohio family history research. We had our first session last night, but all of the sessions are recorded, so it's not too late to sign up for that. And then finally, on April 18th, we have a free webinar on using tax records in your family history research. Um, I'm also just going to throw in, since uh, Kim was mentioning uh, Ulster in Northern Ireland, um, we are having a Northern Irish research tour as well in June that might be of interest to some of you. Um, and you can find more information about that on our website, or you can contact me as well. Uh, you can learn more about these uh, and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, let's go ahead and turn to your questions. Um, so, Kim, we did get several questions about uh, Scottish prisoners of war. Um, so, for example, I'll start um, with this question. Uh, I'm trying to locate someone born in the 1620s, probably in the lowlands. Are there any records available that far back? He was a Scottish prisoner of war who was sent to America in 1651. 
So there's going to be records that far back. I mean, a lot of records can go back to the 1500s. It's really going to, you're going to need to find that parish. It, it, again, those names, there's going to be so many people with the exact same name. If you do think he was a prisoner of war, I would definitely, again, go look at David Dobson's book. If David Dobson has him somewhere, that's where he's going to be. If, if he found him, that's where he's going to be. Um, but you're going to want to go look at that, though, you know, those old church registers um, go into Kirk sessions. But again, it's going to be really difficult if you can't find a place where he came from. Um, so really ask yourself, have you exhausted every possible source on this side of the ocean? Is there a gap of time of 10, 15 years where you can't find him because he was somewhere? So I would definitely ask yourself those, that question. Have you exhausted everything here? And then I would look into David Dobson's books and see if he's got anything. And he's got so many different books. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, then another question here, where is the best place to find information about Scots-Irish leaving Northern Ireland for America in the early 1700s? Any recommendations for that? So again, you there are not going to be passenger lifts. There are, there are, for instance, from Scotland to Ireland, there is a list of about 22 people that can be found on, on find, find my past. So they did just did not have great records going from Scotland to Ireland, Scotland to the colonies or Ireland here. Um, so it's, it's really, um, and especially from the 1700s, you're just not going to find those passenger lists. You're just going to have to use those um, you know, the birth, the marriage, the death, the everything to try to piece it together um, and, and try to make that connection. I, and I know it's so frustrating because that's, like I said, it's just probably the number one question. How do I find my ancestor on a passenger list? Um, and anything again, doing uh, with passenger lists, I would go back to David Dobson again. If he found him, um, that's where he's going to be. Um, he's going to be in his records. And then the other part is look at um, maybe, um, oh, yeah, no, I, that's, it's really the only suggestion. It's just so hard from the 17th century to find them. Um, and that's why I say, if you just have an estimated time, that might be as good as you're going to get. But you can also look for embarkment records. See if there's any embarkment records. I, I would, I would suggest that, um, Go use the research wiki or the um, catalog function on family search if you have the general area and see what kind of emigration uh, records they have there. Thank you, Kim. Um, another question here, um, are there any records uh, kind of going far back that would be in Gaelic and that would need translation? Um, do you know kind of what time period that would be if, if that's the case? Ooh, well, you're going to find once you get into, you're always, you're, you're going to have a lot of handwriting issues and not actually Gaelic, but um, uh, once you get back, I think it's about the 1600s. Um, and, and really, honestly, they always, they almost say that you need to go back and get a new degree in college to read them. <laughs> so, so anything that you find, you're going to um, probably, I would look at the, um, maybe the universities um, and and maybe um, some privately held collections to find those records. I mean, I personally, it's a, that's where a lot of people just kind of stop because they can't read them um, and they have to hire somebody to read them. And it's not going to be as prevalent for probably 90% of the people that are on this webinar today. We kind of start, to, records just kind of start to peter out. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, another question here. Uh, were those Scots serving in the then British militia from, say, 1800 to 1815? Were they typically posted to their homeland areas for their service? Um, so this person is looking at their ancestor who he found in the far northwest of Scotland. And if, he's wondering if that means that's likely where he was born or if maybe he was kind of just stationed there in the militia. Um, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure on the answer to that question. Um, and I don't want to give a, um, I don't want to just presume that I know, um, most of the time they did not travel far from home. Um, so I would imagine the answer to that question is yes. Um, however, um, 
the way that the Scots used to travel is if if you if you were on the west coast, you would not travel far, but generally you would always stay um, in a parish along the west coast, either going up or down. And the same would be said for the east, so uh, the east coast of, of the country. So chances are he's close to there, if that makes sense. He's close to the um, wherever he was in the militia. He is he is somewhere close to there. He, it's not like he came um, across, you know, the country and joined the militia there, if that makes sense. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, some questions asking, what are the best resources for information about Scott and English transplants to Ulster? Unfortunately, there aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> Again, there are no records. There are no records that, um, there are no records that, um, said who came over, um, from, from Scotland to Ulster. Um, like I said, there's literally like this special collection of 22 people. And if you're lucky, you're in there. Um, it's going to be um, investigating that person by by normal historical documents, um, going to find out when did they appear there? Can you make that connection? You know, sometimes they would come with other people. Can you connect those people back to Scotland? It, it's not as simple um it's not as simple as is being able to find oh he went over on this ship from Scotland to Ireland it's just there's just not much there I would say um what I would do is again find my past has so many incredible records um and they just keep adding them all the time um so um you're going to want to look into those more obscure record collections and see if you can't locate them there Great, thank you very much. Um, so I, I don't know if this will be a similar answer that there aren't records, but I'll go ahead and ask this question. Um, somebody says, uh, I descend from the, from the McDougals in the Scottish borders. I view Scotland's people, but can't bridge the migration gap from Highland to Lowland. Any suggestions for that? So I guess I would, it comes down to how do you know for sure that that's your line? Um, have you, you know, I guess I need, would, you know, you might want to, I might need to know the dates that they're talking about. Um, and that might be, can they, how about this? Can they email, email me on that one? Cause I'd like to know the dates. I'd like to know kind of approximately where they were at. I, um, you know, because there's a lot of times, you know, later in the 1800s, yes, a lot of people came down from the highlands into the lowlands, but that wasn't really a very common thing to happen necessarily earlier. So I really need to know a little bit more information. So if they could email me, that would be great. And I'll see if I can help them. Sure, absolutely. Um, I would say, um, and let me see if I can pop this in the chat. Um, if you want to email education at nhgs.org for that question, um, I'll put it in the chat there. Um, we can get that over to, to Kim. Um, all right. And then um, I know we're in overtime. I'll just ask um, maybe one or two more questions here. Uh, so another question, would Dobson have listed women, for example, a widow with several young children who emigrated for Ulster? Um, do you know if that's something he would include? Uh, it is possible if she was a widow. I have seen some females in there. Um, so obviously it's not a stone I would leave unturned. Um, but there, there, there's not a, a lot of times they're not listed. Again, that might deter, depend when she came over. Um, but yes, if she was a widow, she could have been. And sometimes I'm not sure if this is, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if this is for Scotland, this would happen for them, but sometimes they're under their maiden name too. So if you know their maiden name and their married name, um, you know, I, I've seen that before, not necessarily for Scottish records, but I would, I would look into that as well when you are start trying to search for her. Okay, great. Thank you. And like I said, David Dobson has so many books. I mean, just so many books. And, um, and, and I will mention that, um, like I said, you know, his thing was going into the obscure record collections. Um, and, and I've listed on my handout a lot of ways to find those private records, um, uh, manuscript collections that are all over, you know, that are all over. Um, a lot of people will ignore those, but, the, you know, there's a lot of information that can come from them. 
And when you get to those really detailed questions that you want, unfortunately, it's not just as easy as going on Ancestry or going on any of these sites. I mean, um, they just sometimes these records just don't exist and you have to accept that you have to just piece this together, but piece, piece that picture together using what is available to you. Thank you, Kim. And since you mentioned the handout that you prepared, um, I did just pop that in the chat if anyone's interested, and it, there will also be a link in the follow-up email today. Um, Kim prepared a, a very hefty handout, many pages, so lots of information in there as well. Um, okay, great. We'll do uh, one more question here. Um, so a question I know uh, this is a popular one we hear a lot. Um, to what extent can we rely on general ancestry DNA matches to Scott ancestors? So can you read that question one more time? Because I think I don't sure. know if it's specific to ancestry itself. Oh, sure. Yes. So um, to what extent can we rely on general ancestry DNA matches to Scott's ancestors? Okay. So the first thing I would tell you is go and do a DNA test through um, family tree DNA. Uh, I they, they offer, I'm not sure if you can do it depending, but so because they family tree DNA is the only one that does the Y DNA and only does the mitochondrial DNA. And then it does autosomal. Ancestry does not provide that. So if they're speaking just about Ancestry.com, um, I would not rely on it too heavily. Um, I would definitely spend the money to go over to Family Tree DNA and I would join their projects. Um, like I said earlier, they have surname projects. They have location projects. They have, I, I think they have an Ulster um, Ireland project. They have so many different things and there's so much more you can do with DNA um, on Family Tree DNA. So I would... So my answer to that is question. I, I I personally would not rely on ancestry heavily matches. I would I would do it through family tree DNA. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Um, again for this webinar today. I'm just jam packed with lots of information. Um, I know as a Mackenzie myself, I certainly appreciated it. Um, so as I mentioned, we are in overtime. So unfortunately, that is all that we have time for today. Um, if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team, which Kim is a part of, um, or using our expanded chat service. Uh, the chat service is totally free and it puts you in direct communication with a genealogist. It's um, again, totally free and open to the public Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. And to access that service, you can just go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat and um, can't recommend that enough. Um, so uh, as we've mentioned, if we didn't get to your question or you, if you think of one later on, you can also contact us at education at nehgs.org. And thank you again for joining us. You will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's webinar. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Thank you again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.